Thanks again for coming tonight. And uh, I just wanted to start by, by thanking Sarah um, and Lisa Fryman for making this a possibility. Uh, this is by far the biggest work I've ever done. And if it wasn't for the support of the IMA, the staff, uh, there's just there's no way I could have conceived or, or made this project at all. Um, can we lower some of the lights in here? Some? And maybe the one on me a little too? Great. Um, so I wanted to start by giving you a little context. Um, Sarah mentioned that uh, this is a departure for me in some ways. And uh, I wanted to show you a, a few of the things that, that are similar about this piece to, to, to previous works. And I, I, I'm going to show you two videos um, from a series called Actions from 2007 and 2008. And the two videos I've selected of this series of 33 short little actions that I did in my studio uh, represent the kind of the two ways in which I work, basically. One being uh, events that I create for the camera in the landscape or in the studio, and one being ones where I'm kind of absent from the frame and I kind of uh, I just I function as just a catalyst, starting something that can happen without me. And I feel like this piece actually. Uh, unintentionally ends up being exactly that, and um, as you'll see me perform later tonight. So here's uh, two videos from Actions. Thank you. That's, you're supposed to clap, so that was right on there. Yeah. So we, we don't have to do this every time, but you know that's that's okay. Um, so yeah, actions ended up being kind of about uh, creating these deistic systems and uh, and using my body as a kind of catalyst to to start them, and then creating these kind of challenges for myself um, that I knew were physically possible, um, but that I would have to rehearse, you know, in front of the camera until it uh, until I got it right. Um, in the last three years, my work has moved more out of the studio and into the landscape where I've been dealing with uh, using natural forces and kind of collaborating with them to uh, I don't know, perform little actions again, but it, it varies from project to project. The first one I'll show you um, is called, it was, I, I did in, in Chile, Uruguay, and um, Argentina in early 2009, um, and it's called Automatic, and it, it's basically a, a video and drawing project that involved creating these little drawing machines that are powered by uh, the wind and ocean currents. Um, I'll just show you a little bit of this and talk over it as well. So for me, this this project and almost all of the the works that I do, thanks, um, that I do in the landscape, kind of uh, is about tapping into this this sublime 
these sublime forces. And, and this video in particular was one that um, that felt the most acute, um, climbing down the cliffs and putting this little box precariously on the edge. Uh, there was a sense of an incredibly fragile system that I'd created, and I was always uh, astonished that it would be there the next morning if I left it overnight or, or even just a few hours later. Um, the drawings themselves I think of as uh, kind of field recordings um, in that they are recording both the movement of the waves but also any other factors that, that come into play. Uh, it's probably hard to see these, but but the other thing they are uh, uh, that affects them is obviously how I'm constructing them. Each of these is just three points, three little Coke bottles that are floating there. You know, if and, and in this way, you know, I I have a certain control over it. If I'd made it just two, um, they would have just gone back and forth. Or four, obviously, would have been more of a square-like shape. So you know, while I often say that these things are um, mostly being actualized by natural forces, the, the factors, the parameters that I uh, set up uh, often control and contribute to how they're made. Um, the next piece I wanted to show you is called A Line Describing the Sun. And I made this uh, over the course of a couple months last year in the desert. And the project basically involved taking a giant magnifying glass and using it to melt a line in the desert. Um, but what I wanted to kind of tell you about is how the process of coming uh, of making this piece involved this kind of circuitous or roundabout route I'll pronounce better um, in that you know the original idea came um, you know years ago and then through trying to solve things uh, preemptively problems that I hadn't quite yet dealt with uh, I kind of got off track into other areas and would naturally come back in the end um, to the original idea and in some ways that's kind of what happened with this project as well, but I'll just tell you that, uh, so, so in my research about uh, the temperature at which soil melts, I uh, mistake, mistakenly thought that uh, the desert would, be cons could, would consist of sand, which melts at like 3,000 degrees, much hotter than um, any magnifying glass that I could make. So in this like 10, minute, 10 minutes of internet research, I in immediately abandoned the idea of melting the desert and went right to using sugar. Um, because I knew that you know that's like 200 degrees, and it creates this really beautiful caramelized mark, and it's also food, and, and there are also s sorts of possibilities. And I went ahead with this project uh, in that I would put down a layer of sugar, um, melt that, and uh, and then record uh, the the process of its erasure over time. So I scoped out um, using Google Earth like these little playas that I would kind of bisect, and was prepared to make some sort of wildlife video, basically. I, I had begun making the apparatus and finally um, did a few tests uh, you know, out at Floyd Bennett Field just to see how it worked and finally de decided on this kind of steel structure that I could disassemble and, and take out to Wendover where I started working on this. Well, I'll show you two minutes of this now, but the, the long, the short end of the story is that uh, when I finally got to the Mojave Desert where I, where I shot this final piece, um, and I set up the lens, like the, the ground just began to bubble and melt and turn into this beautiful black glassy substance, something th that I could never have anticipated, but um, was like more permanent and, and at the same time fragile than, uh, than I had thought possible. So here's two minutes of a line describing the sun. Can we turn down the lights even more? This is a nice piece.
Great. Um, as I mentioned before, what, what I loved about this piece is that it, there was this permanent action that happened in that the soil that was changed into glass will not go back into soil. It'll turn to dust, but it won't, it, that's not a reversible thing, at least not in, you know, my lifetime. Yet, the mark is still incredibly impermanent in that it's, um, it's very thin, and even, you know, a few months later when I went back, it had, a lot of it had already kind of blown away. Um, the other thing that I hadn't anticipated um, was that the piece didn't end with the sun going down, as I, as I thought at first. Um, instead, you know, the clouds came in and one force kind of uh, gave way to another and uh, the last shot is this, uh, this kind of dust just blowing across uh, the playa, which, uh, will, which is, contributes to its, to its erasure. The original mark is 365 feet and uh, I should have mentioned that it, it's entirely determined by the course of uh, the sun across the sky. I have one back wheel that I can, that I can turn, but the, the lens always needs to main, be perfectly perpendicular to the sun for, in order for the magnification to be at its, at its hottest. Uh, before I showed the piece at my, my gallery in Brooklyn, um, I went back out west and did another all-day performance. But this time, instead of um, basically trying to move the cart as fast as I could, as fast as the sun would melt the line, I, I turned the wheel much at a much sharper angle and ended up just making a 17-foot mark, one that I could excavate um, using water and take back to the gallery to kind of show, in a way, what this actually looks like. Um, the installation, or the, the, the video is installed on two 16 by 9 foot screens flat with the floor and, and we illuminated the, the mark with just a single line of light which kind of allowed you to see it but, but also uh, kept the room really nice and dark. Uh, so I mentioned this whole mistake of, of starting with sugar and, and uh, kind of getting off on a wrong track because these things are never uh, total losses of time. While, at, while in Wendover at, on this residency where I started a line describing the sun um, the gallery space was empty and I asked the director if I could take out all the windows and cover each pane in a different color caramel um, since I had 100 pounds of sugar and he, uh, he said yes and so I spent a weekend cooking and um, ended up making this uh, light piece um, that's, still, that's still up and what, what's fantastic about caramel as a material is that it's, uh, it's incredibly sensitive to the weather conditions so it's humidity not a big factor in Wendover, Nevada, but um, when it is a little bit wetter, it tends to run as well as when it gets warm. Um, so this piece is slowly changing over the course of uh, the, the show, and even in the first week, um, it had kind of dripped a bunch. Um, each pane is different. You know, I, I cook them at slightly different temperatures, but the, the determining factor isn't really my choice here. It's, it's uh, you know, the, the composition of the sugar and the, and the cream of tartare and the, and the amount of water that I kind of mixed up with since I, I really didn't know kind of how to do this, and it was just a, a process of experimenting to see which ones turned out better than the others. Um, and I think this is a video that shows a day of... Well, no, it's a still. So this was a week of uh, a week after we had installed it, a month later, in the back of the building, um, and it's just I, I like that there's this um, clear kind of dichotomy between the the outside that's becoming this kind of messy, sticky, um, abstract work, and and the inside, which is this beautiful light piece. Um, the other thing is that it attracts bugs, and and inevitably they become caught in it, which represents or it reminds me at least of, of those amazing kind of ants caught in resin that we'd see at natural history museums. But, it, but the piece I think of as a kind of, kind of model for geologic time and although you know, things are moving at a pace that I can actually see over the course of a day, um, it certainly feels like it's moving at this um, glacial pace. So uh, when Lisa emailed me about this project, uh, the first feeling besides excitement was one of mostly terror because uh, as you can see there's really no sculptural works that I make and the thought of covering all of these windows in caramel seemed like they weren't going to go for that so um, but I had thankfully a few ideas I came out and had and, and everyone was actually really responsive to them though I'm, I'm quite thankful we didn't go with any of them um, and thankfully I had a residency lined up in Portugal for right after my site visit to, to do a project that I I'll show you a bit of right now. 
um, which got me thinking. So this piece is called Drift, or it's temporarily called Drift until I come up with a better title. And I'm just going to talk over it for a little bit because um, I want to make sure we're good on time. But the project basically involved building a, a personal kind of flotation device that uh, allows me to stand directly on the surface of the, of the river. And it's basically a 50-gallon uh, drum with a very heavy weight, and that weight is calibrated to the combination of my weight and the displacement of the drum. And then I go out with a few rocks in my pockets to just get it just so it sits below the surface. And since it's not tethered to anything, uh, I can float freely kind of around this big eddy because the river is mostly too shallow to go down, but there's a big pool here. So the piece is really about kind of accepting where the current takes me, at least in this one pool, and, and making a document of, of the sounds that I'm hearing while I'm on the river. So I'm holding, the sound that you're hearing is a, is a, is a, um, is a just microphone that's recording the, the morning as, the, as I slowly kind of pan around this space. So I'll let you watch just a second of it. I won't make you watch all 25 minutes. Um, so while shooting this video um, and being in, in, in on location in uh, in Portugal, I'm gonna just I'll just turn it up a little bit later. Um, we shot it from this bridge, and on this bridge there's this 100 foot railing, 100 foot steel railing. And at the very end of the residency, I was doing some experiments using contact microphones, and I set up this little system whereby the rocks that are in the lower right hand frame are basically pulled away from the, the bridge f by the force of the river that um, is pulling against this bottle on the lower left-hand frame. And every so often, it'll find a little spot where the tension becomes less, and that rock will just gently bump into the railing. And since I padded it, it doesn't make any really or much of an acoustic sound at all, but it sets this entire railing in motion. I'm going to turn it up a little now. And it makes this just amazing, constant ringing. And when I heard that, I immediately realized that one of the biggest problems I was having in conceiving a piece for this pavilion space was that I didn't know how to deal with this huge volume. And you know, if I could create this sound in real time somehow, um, I would be very excited. So I, I, I mean, the other thing that came out of this 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 little project was that it it made me realize that like within almost all things there might be like an inherent sound that that we can't hear with our ears but maybe with a, a contact microphone or some sort of sensing device you can activate or or access so a few weeks later on the train i finally like if I, thinking of like what is a big vertical thing that's made of metal it took me a couple weeks to figure it out it's a tower turns out and um so i came <laughs> so this idea of like yes i'll find an old radio tower and i will somehow make it fit in the space and I'll turn it into an instrument. And that was the kind of initial um, starting point, much like I'm going to take a big magnifying glass and burn a line in the desert. And immediately I kind of started thinking about what, what is the force that's going to activate that, especially in this uh, glass vitrine, which is basically the pavilion space. Um, so you know, I, I thought again for a while about that and eventually sent this image um, to Sarah, thinking that I would use this NOAA weather signal, send that signal into resonators around the tower, and you would just hear the tower kind of vibrating, and hopefully it would sound like that. Um, and we pushed forward with this, with this thought because we had to build it. We had to find the tower. There are a lot of things we had to figure out. Um, but I, a few things about the space and how... Um, how it helped me think about the project. I mean, I love this idea of that, of a museum as a vitrine. And most museums aren't all glass, but this space almost is entirely glass, at least one side. So, uh, and I think of vitrines as spaces to kind of enclose cultural objects, to protect them, but also to, to kind of observe ones um, like in a laboratory. And I think in this case, that's what's happening um, well, maybe not so much the cultural thing, but it certainly suggests a cultural significance, some sort of mythological um, 
uh, purpose, at least even in playing it, it feels like that. But scientifically, the idea of taking this tower that uh, in the landscape is, is created to endure all of these natural forces and, and this entire lattice work is, is set up so this thing won't move and then inverting it into itself so that it'll fit in the space and then basically allowing it to be totally free of all forces and then just sending little pulses into it either through playing it myself or through this weather radio signal it was a really nice idea of, or opportunity to just listen to what this thing sounds like when, when it's totally free of any other forces. So that was the idea and a little more research confirmed that radio towers are actually much, much bigger than the size of the tower that we could fit in that space. And they're actually not the same structure. I, I wanted this triangular structure or, or a square structure, but, but a pyramid shape that we could use its kind of hollow space to fit it inside itself. So the one, the towers that we could find online, mind you this was in like December, were a certain series of towers, this kind of Rhone self-supporting tower series. Um, so we designed, I designed the, the basic alteration that would happen and this is what I gave my fabricators and the red areas are the parts that we would eliminate. And uh, the, the thing that was kind of a, a surprise too is that the act, this, this structure, this kind of la interwoven lattice structure is much, much more beautiful than, than the original design that I had come up with, with like, you know, right angled railings. Um, and so January was mostly a, a mad dash trying to find a used 120 foot tower with a nine and a half foot base, which I found three, two of which were bought out from under me, um, which I realized this is, like, this is like a hot commodity. If you have a tower, you kind of need to pay cash right away for it because uh, like someone else will just outbid you immediately. And, and, um, <laughs> but finally I found a guy outside of uh, St. Louis who uh, said he would hold the tower and we managed to uh, order it and, and ship it to, to Brooklyn. But when he sent me these pictures of it, uh, I was really, I, I realized how kind of important it was that we hadn't manufactured this thing, that it had a life before it entered the museum and that here it was just lying in the snow um, before it had been somewhere else. And that idea of kind of the history of this object is, is really important for the piece. Um, I'm going to whip through a few pictures just so you can see part of the process of, of making this and unloading it. Uh, it came on a semi that uh, four of the pieces for the 20 foot lengths were assembled, another 40 feet were not. Um, we spent a cold day, or I spent a cold day, shoveling the street um, after a big snowstorm in Brooklyn to make way for the, uh, the forklift. But most of the towers actually um, can break down into smaller pieces that two guys can handle. And with the, uh, my, my gallery generously let me use their, one of their awesome gallery spaces where I'd shown um, a line describing the sun because it's one of the only spaces I know of in Brooklyn that I could access in February to the middle of March that actually has a, a, a above a 40 foot ceiling, which is what we needed to, to fabricate this thing. Um, so the process involved, you know, making these cuts, uh, welding on these new feet for the, the tower to kind of link up and then coming up with a system to install it since the middle part is above the ground and, and the, the top of the middle part is below the top of the entire tower. And we came up with a system in which uh, the, the, the inner piece was lifted first um, and then kind of sat on a false work base which allowed us to pull up the individual legs uh, afterwards and then lattice up the rest at the end. So this is the, uh, the false work base that holds the, the in, basically can hold the entire tower weight. Um, this was our, uh, a much nicer ceiling at the IMA, believe it or not, than, than here. But um, the entire thing weighs about 3,000 pounds and uh, the fun part at the end, Sarah and I were just kind of moving it, rotating it on an angle and deciding kind of where we want it to sit. And there's something really nice about seeing the entire thing just moving on like a pinpoint. So after getting this all constructed, false work out began a two week process of building the audio components. And I worked with a great sound designer and engineer named Bob Belecki who worked on Julian Swartz's piece that was in here. It was a bunch of hanging speakers a few years ago, a few years ago called Terrain. So he was familiar with the space and uh, basically constructed the program that we could send in the NOAA signal and work with a few inputs. And after testing what the NOAA signal sounded like going into it, it was clear we, we needed something 
uh, we needed something else because it just wasn't it was it was it just wasn't beautiful it wasn't interesting it was just a bad radio signal coming off the tower kind of um so we went out and we bought a couple of guitar pickups plugged them into the contact mics and the first second i just put it up to it it just it just sung it just like it just began humming and and this feedback kind of going through this really complicated structure that doesn't sound exactly like feedback when you just put a microphone up to a speaker where there's there's like total efficiency there's nothing in the way in this case there's all of these tubes and and lattices that that sound and the vibrations are going through that that make it i think sound quite interesting and, and beautiful so here is here is a little drawing i made to kind of help explain this um I'm holding the electric guitar pickup. That that signal goes to the computer. It mixes with a NOAA signal that I control periodically, and it's sent to resonators and speakers that get the tower. Um, that basically that, that creates a huge feedback loop, one that's both acoustic and physical. So there are there are kind of more quiet physical resonance, resonances of the tower when it's just vibrating and humming, and the sound is actually just coming off of the the tower itself. And then there are acoustic feedback loops where it's going mostly through this through the tubes and making more of a pitch um, and the thing that that uh, was a great discovery this week was realizing that the software we were using and the programs we were using since everything goes through the computer unlike an acoustic uh, performance where you know my hitting the tower like this create and makes a recording that's separate from the structure because all of the inputs go through the computer. When I make a recording of that, it's exactly the same as when, it sounds exactly the same as when I play it live. So for me, this was, a, this was actually a great way to bring my actions back to this piece. So the, the sounds that are up during the show are a mix of the live weather radio and, and these, the kind of best parts of the sounds that I could make out of the tower that are actually not just sounds, but they're a record of my movements around it and where I held this thing. Um, so in that way, it kind of comes back to this idea of, of the history of an object and, and the forces that go through it. Um, conceptually, the piece ended up being far more totemic and uh, mythological than, than I anticipated, though I, I thought a lot about why I was interested in that. And I rewatched, you know, 2001 um, and listened to the audio there just to see if I could get any ideas. And, and I, but I think, you know, the symbol of kind of technolog technology here is not so dissimilar from, from this kind of uh, utilitarian tower turned into a kind of aesthetic instrument. Um, the other one is Tatlin's um, Monument to the Third International, which is more of a mythology for not being constructed, but, but being this kind of, you know, tower that would be like four times the size of the Eiffel Tower and was kind of just a feat of the imagination. On the one hand, I feel like the, I, I see in this tower these kinds of monumental, mythical, mythological parts, and then I see kind of an, an instrument, and not musical, but, but um, uh, scientific, whether uh, some, something to communicate information or to listen to something. And on the NOAA website, they have this great series of old instrument pictures. Um, and I find these interesting, just, just aesthetically, but, but also kind of in, as technologies improve, that, you know, we've kind of made some big changes. But the structures are kind of the same. They're still using these kind of lattice work uh, things that, are, that we see everywhere. The last image um, reference that I think of, uh, it just helps to explain a little bit about the title. Um, Divining Meteorology, I came to after like nine months of, of thinking, and, uh, and I thought that the word divining was an important to keep in the piece because both the system by which I play it is in some ways, you know, me holding these two things up to this thing and feeling both the physical vibrations and, and listening to these subtle changes and trying to direct this thing that's not totally controllable. For me, that experience, although I've never tried divination, or, um, it's not so dissimilar. And certainly the idea of this weather radio that's essentially predicting the future um, not one that we're surprised at, you know, that, that that was an original place in which people would use this f systems of divination, whether looking at the insides of onions or, or the innards of chickens to kind of predict where the weather was going. Um, so, you know, here's a, an image that we made last night, just doing a document of performing this thing to give you a sense of what 
what's to come. The thing I will say, um, for having made this instrument, I, I feel in some, in some ways very frustrated that I'm, I'm not better at playing it over the last two weeks of just being here and, and knowing what I want to do and hearing it sometimes and thinking I can reproduce it by basically holding the contacts in the same place. But this is an incredibly complicated system and it's great that way. It's one that I can't totally control and, and in some ways I, have to, I, I accept that begrudgingly though because um, you know I'm, I'm used to kind of the ability to take the best moments and be able to string them together into, into a, a video or a, a piece that I feel great about. So just a word of caution as, I, as we transition into the performance. Um, the last two slides I'll show you um, are, are fun in that you know we made this final rendering um, to give an idea of what it would look like. And, you know, Sarah and I were just kind of, we were like, why doesn't it look right when we we're, you know, orienting the piece? And, and we realized it didn't look right because it wasn't exactly like the rendering. So then we, we corrected that. And, um, but in fact, I think it, it, it did kind of need to be oriented this way. And, um, and so it's just thrilling to have it all come together. And uh, thanks again for listening.